Parts of Antarctica are warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. This is having an effect on wildlife and is altering deep ocean currents which regulate the world's climate from the poles to the equator. As Antarctica's ice melts, we're seeing global sea levels rise and unpredictable changes to weather worldwide. In this Earthrise special, we visit the world's most remote continent to see the effects of climate change firsthand. I'm Tarek Basley and I'll be spending the next month on this research vessel traveling around Antarctica with a group of scientists who are trying to understand how the changes taking place there will affect us all. I joined the expedition in Hobart, Australia. The Russian research ship Akademik Trezhnikov has been hired by the Swiss Polar Institute to circumnavigate Antarctica. It'll be a floating laboratory from which 55 scientists will do 22 different experiments. David Walton has been visiting Antarctica for more than 50 years and is the expedition's chief scientist. Because the Antarctic um, and the Southern Ocean actually influence the whole of the global weather system and all the currents uh, in the oceans. It matters to everybody. It also matters if the Antarctic begins to melt as far as world sea level is concerned. It's the largest source of uh, new water added to the oceans in the world. So even if you live somewhere a long way away, if you're low lying and on the coast, the Antarctic matters to you. The voyage will take us two and a half thousand kilometres south from Hobart to the edge of Antarctica. We'll then travel 5,000 kilometres east, making stops at a number of islands. Then after a month at sea, we'll return to port in southern Chile. First, we must cross what are known as the Furious 50s and Screaming 60s, latitudes known for their ferocious weather. We face 100 km hour winds and 10 metre waves. It's an early reminder of the potent energy of the oceans. As we sail south, the air and sea fast become colder. Then, on the sixth morning, we wake up to sea ice. Soon, we're forced to navigate around icebergs, some the size of a football pitch, others are more than 100 kilometers long. Then, finally, we arrive at the Mertz Glacier in Antarctica. Just look at those sea cliffs of icicles dropping off them and these amazingly powerful winds coming in off the glacier and dropping down into the sea. This coast here is the windiest place on the planet at sea level and it's certainly playing up to that reputation today. The Mertz Glacier fascinates scientists because in 2010 an enormous chunk, around 75 by 35 kilometres, broke off after it was nudged by a large iceberg. This has dramatically changed the flow of ice in the area. It's also exposed large areas of ocean floor for study for the first time. The weather comes right and the ship parks its bow up against the glacier. This gives the scientists a stable platform to begin their work. So this is your submarine, right? Yeah, exactly. So Guillaume Massé is, is a biologist and in charge of an ambitious project. It's like something out of a science fiction movie. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite amazing. I mean, uh, there is so much gear on it. I call it the Swiss Army knife. The Swiss Army knife yeah. of, of Antarctic discovery. Yes, exactly. It's so well, take me through some of things there because I, mean, I can see okay. lights but there's an awful lot of cables and so well I think something you must know is all these cameras basically we've got very high definition cameras so yeah. we've got digital still one HD camera 
one 4K camera here. Basically, we are interested in the ice column. So very soon we'll dive along the ice column, along this, uh, the front of the, the glacier. The team expects to see a vertical wall of ice dropping 500 metres from the surface, but instead there's a surprise. They discover a huge underwater cavern beneath this part of the glacier. The seawater is warmer than expected and there's unusual evidence of melt. We went really close to the ice and discovered that it was kind of a really rotten ice. Everything was kind of melting away with some kind of a a lot of uh, kind of holes in the ice and um, yeah, completely rotten. We were not expecting that on the glacier really, and not especially not at this depth and kind of so far into the glacier. Warmer ocean currents are now flowing further south towards Antarctica. Scientists believe the kind of melt we've seen here will contribute more than a meter to global sea level rise by the end of the century and up to 13 metres over the next 500 years. Glaciers are like rivers of ice, so when the ocean water warms and they melt, the remaining ice moves faster towards the sea. A team of glaciologists want to see how this is happening and drill ice cores from next to the glacier's edge. Seven metres down, they find something unexpected. You see the bubbles in the, in the core? Yes. I think these bubbles probably can, these contain water, probably quite salty water. Finding salt water here suggests warmer ocean currents are having an impact, possibly weakening the glacier from beneath. The helicopters return and the ice cores are loaded on board. Back on the ship, they're placed in a giant freezer. The history of this ice is that it, it first falls as snow right. onto the continent and then at depth, the pressure of the, the snow above it is, is compressing, compressing. At a depth of about 60 metres, this will be so compressed that it forms solid ice. One of the principles of, of ice core science is that while that's happening, uh, the air um, from the atmosphere that, that, was, that is in this snow when it fell is slowly being locked um, into, you see these bubbles forming? Right. And gradually as we get deeper under more and more pressure, these bubbles get isolated and you see these little bubbles and that's, you know, when we get deeper into the ice, ice cores and we want to look at carbon dioxide concentrations back thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, it's, it's those little pockets of the atmosphere that we get into. So you see that process starting here. Few ice cores have been taken from this part of Antarctica, so there's little specific information about how the climate is changing. But it's hoped these samples will help fill this gap. Further east lie the Balleny Islands. For most of the year, they're locked in sea ice, but a visit like this in summer means a team of scientists can dredge the ocean floor, and I've been drafted in to help. We're getting better and better at this. This is a good idea. A certain amount of the uh, rocks and mud from the bottom have come up in the net, so their technique is pretty much to use this fire hose to blast out all the rocks and the mud, and then after that, they can get it the uh, various uh, creatures that have come up with it. Of particular interest are those that take carbon from the environment by locking it away in their shells. These then end up being buried in the seabed when they die. Is that another astrotoma, the small one? Over the last hundred years, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have risen dramatically, largely as a result of our burning of fossil fuels. The role these creatures play to counteract this needs to be better understood and incorporated in climate change models. Tiniest little brittle star. 
Magnificent, absolutely perfect, but a little more than a centimetre across. This is, uh, the entire skeleton is made of carbon. Um, these guys here, the encrusting worms, right. and these tiny things here, they don't look like much, but there are hundreds of little carbonaceous animals there. I mean, it's extraordinary to think that, that as we pump carbon out into the skies and we burn oil, uh, it's creatures like these that are in some way providing a small amount of balance to the, to the Earth system and, and to the carbon systems on the planet. Once sorted, the creatures are taken to the lab and photographed. The sea mouse is a notable catch. So too, this brittle star. Another uncurls itself, measuring around 50 centimetres across. Many of these creatures will be preserved, and after the expedition, their DNA will be analysed, giving the researchers detailed data about their distribution and diversity. So having picked over this and looked through it for anything of interest, there are still a lot of rocks left and there's only one thing to do on a ship like this, you don't need extra ballast, it's over the edge. The Robos team also turned their cameras on life on the sea floor. At a depth of 900 metres, they take samples of cold water corals and a wide variety of other species. They also take sediment cores. These will give them clues about what's being buried in the ocean floor and how it's changed over time. But it's later in the dive that an extraordinary observation is made. We have this a sea star, more precisely a brittle star, crawling on the sea floor, which we believe in a mud or scavenger. But suddenly, you have a fish just crawling and just hit the fish with a poison we don't know yet, because that's, that's just new. We've never seen that before. And it just, and the fish lay on the side, and suddenly this brittle star just roll it and start to eat a fish, which can swim at a, at a speed much, 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 much faster than any kind of of sea star who can crawl on the sea floor. So that's quite amazing just to see that. That's, that, that's totally new. Close analysis of the footage reveals 10 examples of this behavior. These are two of the most abundant species living in Antarctic waters. An interaction of this nature has important implications for understanding climate change. All the carbon which is contained into this fish then transported directly to the bottom of the ocean and ultimately buried there. We do know quite a lot of organisms, including marine organisms, which are very efficient at poisoning their prey. And I, I think this is the case, but we still have to, to do a bit more research. We've made a discovery, but now it means that we have to, to do further research to really understand what we've seen here. Antarctica has the cleanest air on the planet. And at each stop on the voyage, atmospheric scientist Julia Shamali has used a mobile kit to take samples. She's also packed a suite of instruments into a shipping container on board. Hi, Julia. Hey. How's it going? I found you in the big red yeah. box out here on deck. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Thanks very much. Wow, you've got, you've got stuff packed yeah. in here. Why are you so interested in the air? Well, so actually in particular, we're interested in the tiny particles that are in the air. We call them aerosol, aerosol particles. And they are very important uh, for the water cycle um, because they form clouds. Without these tiny particles, we would not have any cloud in our atmosphere. Um, so it would never rain. Um, Earth would be a completely different planet see if uh, particles can, can form droplets or not, uh, we use 
this machine and You've this got a cloud machine here. Exactly. Yeah, you're actually it's, making your own cloud. So we're making our own cloud in here. So it's very important for us to understand how did clouds form before the industrial revolution, before humankind actually started burning fossil fuels in large amounts. Right. Um, because it makes a big difference uh, for our climate, um, for the clouds and for the hydrological cycle in general. Climate change models are generally better at predicting variations in temperature rather than precipitation. It's hoped the data from this experiment will amend that. As the ship continues east, we come across more sea ice. We're now crunching our way through the ice because we've come across these sea ice flows. I'm going to drop the camera down just so you can have a look what the bow's doing down there. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Luckily for us anyway, the bow of this 12,000 ton icebreaker rides up over the ice, crunching. There it is. Look at that the power crunching through the sea ice. Look, here comes another enormous chunk. Let's see how this one fares under the bows of the Academy Trezhnikov, pushed out of this way. The next stop is at one of the smallest islands on this leg of the voyage. Just five football pitches in size, Scott Island is washed over by waves. And in stormy conditions, it's accessible only by helicopter. It's too windswept for seabirds to nest here, but lichen and moss do grow in the cracked volcanic rocks. Hopefully with the moss and the soil, we're gonna find invertebrates in that. Uh, it gives us an idea of how the animals have coped through not only, uh, I guess, climate change in the past, uh, which is mostly natural, but also how they may move and adapt in the, uh, you know, in facing the future. Before we can be flown off the island back to the ship, there's a sudden change in the weather. The helicopter's clearly been grounded on the ship. They're not able to return to the island to pick us up. We have enough uh, equipment with us and a tent and, and rations for uh, four days. So I don't think there's a great concern there, but it does start you thinking about how you could possibly survive on an island like this, so remote and so far from the rest of the world. Fortunately, the weather lifts just long enough to fly us off the island, and we're saved from ever having to find out. Back on the ship, the samples are dried. It's hoped any living things will drop out. This lichen is also examined, and within it, there's a discovery. Smaller than a pinhead, this is the first time this tiny mite has been found here. Similar mites have been found in other parts of the continent, but it's likely that this is a new species, something only DNA tests after the expedition can confirm. The landscape here is incredibly old, so it, you know, it probably started off 180 million years ago. It would have been a tropical rainforest, and it now looks like it does outside. And so these are some of the few things that have probably managed to hang on that long, and so now they're some of the most successful organisms that, that live here. So we'd have to come out the same way. That takes more time. That's maybe... Uh... The teams meet to discuss their next move. From satellite images, it appears the next island on their route, Peter I, is surrounded by sea ice. This will make a visit difficult. Instead, some of the scientists call for the voyage to divert. They've spotted clear water around a coastal area which is normally locked in sea ice. It's a rare opportunity for them to attempt a visit. The ship's course is changed and we arrive at Mount Sipal. It's one of the continent's tallest and most isolated volcanoes, rising more than 3,000 metres from the sea. We scout the area and find a large number of Adelie penguins. But it's only when you come to Antarctica and are able to see them in their natural environment, you see what an extraordinary animal they are and just how 
incredibly tough they are living and nesting in this area. You can see they're landing on these rocks and they're walking their way up through these valleys and then nesting on the top of this bluff above us here. By the time we return to the ship, it's late in the evening. But at this time of year, at such high latitudes, it doesn't get dark. Instead, there's a long and spectacular sunset. The following morning, we fly back to Mount Saipal. Less than 1% of Antarctica is ice-free, making a place like this prime real estate for nesting. Many of the chicks have been left to fend for themselves while their parents go to sea to catch krill, the pinkish colour of the shrimp-like food often ending up staining their fronts. As far as we know, scientists have never visited this uh, penguin colony before, so the group we're with want to know how large it is and whether there's any other species living here. We have um, behind me a whole lot of Adelie penguin. I'm just going to turn around here, show you this chap here. He, uh, he's looking a bit odd because he's losing his baby feathers. He's just a few months old, as you can see. He's very friendly. When the parents return, they're much in demand, sometimes from their own offspring, but frequently from other hungry birds hoping for a feed. It's late in the season, and many are exercising their wings in preparation to leave. The nice thing about penguins and other seabirds is they give you this sort of canary in the coal mile indication as to what's happening in the Southern Ocean. And uh, yeah, this is a significant colony, it's big. This colony appears to be thriving, but on the Antarctic Peninsula to the east of here, it's a different story. The area is warming faster than any other place on the planet, and colonies of Adeli penguins like these have been abandoning their nesting sites and moving south, perhaps in search of colder locations, certainly upsetting many hundreds, if not thousands, of years of breeding behaviour. Over the previous weeks, we've been to some extraordinary places and seen dramatic evidence of climate change. It's change many of the scientists feel should be ringing alarm bells in the rest of the world. In the same uh, way that the Antarctic um, sea ice is actually changing in terms of its distribution and pattern, the sea is warming off the Antarctic Peninsula, the glaciers are retreating, Arctic sea ice is at its lowest uh, yet known, these are all indications that the world as a whole is warming um, and that we need to be concerned about the future. We certainly do know enough to say we need to act now. We should have acted yesterday, figuratively speaking. There is not much time uh, to postpone action into the future. I think um, we're, we're very clear about this. We come back with uh, a better knowledge. We still have some work to do. Um, we're already kind of planning for new um, experiments, new expeditions to try and really understand what we've seen here. The expedition has collected tens of thousands of samples and millions of megabytes of data. For these scientists who will return to their labs around the world, there's years of work ahead. We're just scratching the surface to understand how Antarctica is so important, so significant when it comes to the broader issues of climate change and, and really where the Earth is going to go, where our climate is going to go in the years ahead. The scientific findings made on this voyage will add weight to what's now overwhelming proof that our planet is warming and that climate change is posing a serious threat to the sustainability of life on Earth. The evidence is clearer than ever. What's needed now is for people everywhere to accept the science, engage with the problem and take action.